Hi everyone, this is Mrs. Malloy. Welcome back. This is lecture number four, unit 5A. So while the Renaissance was happening in Europe, hmm, what was going on elsewhere? Well, we've already learned about the Renaissance and how Europeans experienced significant progress and enlightenment from the Middle Ages. We've also learned about how the renewed interest in all things Greco-Roman will change society in so many ways and lead to many political and religious changes in Europe as well. The 13 to 1500s in Europe, termed the Renaissance by so many scholars, can be deemed a true golden age for European culture. But what we need to remember is that there were already cultures elsewhere that were blossoming and experiencing their own golden ages. The European contact with Islamic civilizations due to the Crusades and massive trading of goods most likely created the conditions for a golden age in Europe. Well, today's lecture will focus on several of the Islamic civilizations that were already experiencing golden ages from 1300 to 1700. These include the Ottoman Empire, which lasted from 1300 to the early 20th century, as well as the Safavid Empire from the 1400s to the mid-1700s. Well, today we're going to start with the Ottomans. With the Byzantine Empire in decline, attacks across Anatolia by the Mongols, Asia Minor was inhabited in the early 1300s by nomadic Turkish people with Seljuk origins. Remember the Seljuks from a couple of units ago? Go back and review Unit 4A. Asia Minor was also surrounded by several Islamic empires by 1300. Eventually, these Turks are going to unite with one another and gradually build an empire that spanned three continents. Many of these Turks had converted to Islam and identified themselves as Ghazis. Look how that's spelled. Write it down. Ghazis. Ghazis were warriors for Islam. They were highly religious and militaristic, often invading surrounding territories of peoples who were not Muslim. Eventually, one of the most famous of the Ghazis, a guy named Osman, built a small country on Asia Minor. Osman was also known by the name Othman or Otman, and those who followed him became known as Ottomans. So now you know the origins of the word Ottoman. So clearly the Ottoman Empire must have been an empire built initially by the followers of Osman, right? Subsequent leaders after Osman include Osman's son, Orkan I, who began using the title of Sultan to describe himself. And then subsequent leaders also use this title. Sultan means overlord or one with power. The Ottomans began attacking the crumbling Byzantine Empire, but were fairly lenient to the people they defeated. They didn't force people to convert to Islam, for instance, although non-Muslims were taxed. The Ottomans continued to expand their influence across the region, and they gained more and more territory. This quest for more land was briefly interrupted by a warrior and his army from Central Asia named Timur the Lame. And no, he wasn't lame as in, OMG, that's as lame as one of Mrs. Malloy's lectures. Rather, Timur the Lame gained this name due to an unfortunate war injury. Timur was impaled with an arrow through his leg, which resulted in his becoming lame, as in he couldn't walk easily following the injury. Despite this injury, he defeated Ottoman forces at the famous Battle of Ankara in 1402. Ankara, by the way, if you don't remember, is the current capital of modern-day Turkey. Did you know that? Right. Anyway, Timur became bored with the Ottoman territory he'd conquered, and he took off for more interesting prospects in China. With Timur gone, four Ottoman brothers began fighting for control over the Ottoman Empire. A man named Mehmed I became the new sultan, and he, along with his own sons, continued to build up the Ottoman Empire until around 1566. Mehmed I's grandson was a man named Mehmed II. That's easy to remember, right? Anyway, Mehmed II also was called Mehmed the Conqueror. How did he get this nickname, you ask? Well, Mehmed II attacked Constantinople and was able to take over the city. See, if you don't remember, Constantinople was, or Constantinople was still ruled by the, the Byzantine Empire at that point. Anyway, he was able to conquer the city. It was an amazing feat. No one thought he could do it. 
He couldn't attack Constantinople by sea because the Byzantines had the narrow Bosphorus Strait blocked with a huge chain. So Mehmed II, used, using um, military technology, dragged 70 ships across land using greased runners underneath the ships. Hmm, that's pretty, uh, that's pretty amazing. Anyway, this allowed him to get the ships past the Bosphorus Strait and into the harbor beyond it. He was then able to launch an assault on Constantinople from two sides. Mehmed became known from that moment on as Mehmed the Conqueror. Mehmed proved to be a wise and devoted leader to those he conquered. He was religiously tolerant, and soon Constantinople, from, from that point on, not only became known as Istanbul, but was a city that included Jews, Christians, Muslims, Turks, as well as non-Turks. It was a multicultural trading center for the world. During the 1500s, the Ottoman Empire defeated the Safavid Empire from Persia. The Ottoman Empire stretched all the way to Egypt, and it should be noted that the Ottomans, they defeated portions of the Safavid Empire in Persia, but they didn't completely take it over or defeat it until well into the 1750s. But more on that later. Anyway, the Ottoman Empire stretched all the way to Egypt, including most of the Middle East as well. One of the most famous of all the Ottoman leaders was Suleiman, or Suleiman, the lawgiver. Under Suleiman, Ottoman culture flourished, and the Ottomans experienced a golden age for over 46 years. Suleiman's legal code, for instance, continues to influence legal systems across the world, including our own. Suleiman was most well known for fighting against corruption within government, and he believed in something called a balanced budget clearly something we can learn from in our own nation. Suleiman also expanded Ottoman territory to include much of North Africa and battled against several European monarchs. Suleiman also created a well-organized government and established a legal code by which all people were required to live, including leaders. Isn't that interesting, making your leaders bound to the same laws that you're bound to? Hmm. Suleiman also established a system for social mobility for non-Muslims, right? In many Islamic civilizations, practitioners of other religions were often not allowed to hold government positions or move up the social hierarchy, Ooh, my favorite word, and sometimes they enjoyed legal status that was well below Muslim citizens. Well, Suleiman created a bureaucratic system called Devshirmay. Dev Shermay. I know it looks like Dev Shermay or something, but it's Dev Shermay. Anyway, Dev Shermay was a system established to train Christian young men to become military leaders. These men were required to convert to Islam, but were given specialized training that allowed them to climb the social ranks. It also became so prestigious, in fact, to belong to the Dev Shermay ranks that Christian families would often bribe officials or try to bribe officials to take or accept their sons for this service, even if it meant converting to Islam. Many of these young men became part of an elite squad called the Janissaries. Very important term, Janissaries. I know the term probably sounds a little weird to you, so I'll put this in terms that you, you do understand. Basically, Janissaries were the Navy SEALs or the Green Berets of their day. Their discipline and skill made them the powerhouse behind the powerful Ottoman Empire. Suleiman was also known for religious tolerance, allowing those of other religions to establish their own mini-countries within the Ottoman Empire. These mini-countries were called millets. No, not that kind of millet. Yeah, millet, spelled the same way but different meaning. Actually, did any of you know that millet is also a grain? Yeah, cool. Anyway, Suleiman also helped to usher in a golden age for the Ottomans. He encouraged education, the study of poetry, geography, astronomy, mathematics, and architecture. It was one of Suleiman's famous architects, in fact, that created one of Suleiman's most well-known architectural feats, the Mosque of Suleiman, located in modern-day Albania. Albania is a small country located on the Balkan Peninsula. Yeah, not far away from Bosnia, Croatia, and Serbia, okay? That peninsula. Many people have likened Suleiman's reign as an era like the Renaissance in Europe. Oh, and by the way, it should be noted that um, Albania, you know, speaking of the Balkan Peninsula, you've also, you also learned about this year a very famous person from a place called Macedonia, which is on the Balkan Peninsula. Um, remember? Remember who I'm talking about? Yeah, go back and look it up. 
All right. Anywho, um, yeah, but I digress. Right. So many people have likened Suleiman's reign as an era like the Renaissance in Europe. Suleiman helped merge artwork, poetry, and literature from many sources and cultures. Combining these types of things from various cultures is also called cultural blending. Last year, you studied Japanese culture and learned about how they selectively borrowed things that they liked from other places. Well, cultural blending is not unlike what the Japanese did throughout history. So cultural blending, it's pretty important. Wow, cultural blending. Hmm, that's not unlike Alexander the Great and his blending of Greek culture and Persian culture to create, wow, what we call Hellenistic culture. Remember that? Yeah, Alexander the Great. He's the dude from Macedonia. See, I brought it all together there. Right. So Suleiman, for all his greatness, he had some family issues and problems. He actually killed his oldest son and he forced another into exile, which means he kicked him out of the country and told them not to come back or told him not to come back. Suleiman's third son was super weak and he took power, but he proved to be a fairly ineffective ruler. And Geez, I wonder how much of that was that he had these shoes that he could never possibly fill. I mean, no pressure there or anything. Wow. Anyway, subsequent sultans were much, much weaker. However, despite this weak leadership, the Ottoman Empire survived until after World War I. So why remember the Ottomans? Well, hey, they became real pros at cultural blending. But did you know they actually borrowed cultural blending from an empire that they eventually conquered? Yeah, Earlier in my lecture, I told you about the Safavid Empire getting conquered by the Ottoman Turks by the mid-1700s. Well, the Safavids were the ones who used cultural blending techniques that the Ottomans later copied. So who were the Safavids? Okay, in a nutshell, the Safavids were a Shia Muslim dynasty, which means they were a ruling family, a Shia Muslim family, that ruled Persia between the 15 and 1700s. Their culture blended Persian, Ottoman, and Arab influences. Hmm. You know, Alexander the Great had copied a lot of those influences into his own culture, too. This cultural blending thing seems to be happening everywhere. Wow. All right. Well, cultural blending is the, com the combining of cultures as these cultures come into contact with one another. What's another term for this? Well, cultural diffusion, of course. So where, why does cultural blending happen? Number one, migration. People migrate for a number of reasons, and as they move, they bring along their own cultures. Number two, pursuit of religious freedom or conversion. People migrate in order to find a place where they can freely practice their religion. They naturally will spread their practices to wherever they settle or to whomever they come in contact. People also hold on to some of their own practices when they convert to a new religion. This is true in Bosnia today, where most people are Muslim, and although people in Bosnia identify themselves as Muslim, their cultural practices are highly European in nature. Number three, trade. When people buy things from one another, they pick up on new practices and are introduced to new things. Number four, finally, conquest. When a region is conquered by another group of people, they influence them culturally. Some of the cultural changes that occur from cultural blending include language, religion, or religion or ethical systems, I should say, styles of government, racial and ethnic blending, as well as new forms of art and architecture. The Safavids built a powerful empire before being conquered by the Ottomans using a powerful military. One of their most powerful military leaders was, wait for it, only 12 years old. Yeah, while all of you were still playing with your pretty ponies, World of Warcraft or Grand Theft Auto, Ismail, that was the 12-year-old who I'm talking about, but this 12-year-old was actually fighting. By age 14, he had conquered all of what we now call Iran. And, you know, they speak Persian in Iran, which is now called Farsi, the language that they speak. Anyway, Ismail took the Persian title of king, which is Shah, S-H-A-H, -H, Shah. Later this year, we're going to learn about the Shah of Iran and the takeover of the embassy in Iran in 1979. Think Argo, the movie, uh, but more on that later. But yeah, Shah. Anyway, Shah Ismail, perhaps due to his emotional immaturity, we'll never know, was a ruthless and cruel leader. Hmm, how Machiavellian, right? 
Ismail also suffered defeats to his army by the Ottomans. Well, Ismail's son was able to thwart off an attack by the Ottomans by improving military technology. By securing the Safavid borders, his son helped usher in a golden age of cultural blending for the Safavids. One of the most famous of the Safavid rulers was Shah Abbas, or Abbas the Great, a.k.a. Abbas the Great, who took power in 1587. Abbas made a number of reforms, including creating a powerful army. He also enacted change in government and enlisted the help of foreigners to help advise his government officials. Look at that, cultural blending in action. Shah Abbas also created a glorious new capital city called Esfahan, located in what is now called Armenia in Central Asia. We're going to later learn this year about a genocide that happened in Armenia in the early 20th century, but more on that later. Shah Abbas also promoted cultural blending by bringing artists and writers to his empire from places as far away as China. Safavid trade also promoted cultural blending, clearly. <laughs> there was a demand for Safavid Persian carpets from across the globe. These Persian rugs adorned royal court courts as far away as Europe. Unfortunately, like so much of what we've learned about this year, all empires eventually come to an end. The Safavid Empire ended following internal struggles and bad leadership, and the territory was eventually taken over by the Ottoman Empire in the late 1700s. Thanks for listening, mes amis. Bye.